Okay. And with that, I think we are live and on YouTube here. Um, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Education at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by uh, filmmaker Rachel Boynton. Welcome, Rachel. Um, we're going to be talking about her forthcoming, uh, and when I say forthcoming, I mean just a couple days from now, uh, her forthcoming documentary film entitled Civil War or Who Do We Think We Are? Uh, and it's all about the experience of teaching and learning about the Civil War in classrooms around the nation. So I think it's going to be a great conversation. Uh, and if at any point anyone has any questions for myself or Rachel, please drop them in the comments uh, and we'll get to those as soon as we're able to get to those. Uh, and we'll get to as many as we can. Sometimes we get a, a lot of questions, which we'd be happy to have lots of questions. So we'll tackle as many as we can manage in the time that we have. Um, of course, uh, we are happy to have everyone watching with us. Um, if you enjoy the videos, please, uh, hit the like button, subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with all the programming that we're doing. And if you wanna take your support to the next level, uh, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. It supports great programming like this, uh, and it helps us continue bringing that to you on a regular basis. So it really helps us, uh, and we'd be really grateful if, uh, for anyone who's able to do that. I'll post a link uh, to membership in the, uh, the comments here in just a little bit. I see we've already got a, a ton of folks uh, watching from, uh, of course, our hometown of Frederick, Maryland, but we got Upper Marlboro, Maryland, Orlando, Florida, Springfield, Illinois, uh, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, we're, we're, we're all over the place uh, today, which is, which is always fun to see. So thanks for tuning in today. Um, now, Rachel, why don't you get us started and tell us a, a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, how you got interested in filmmaking uh, in the first place? Well, I, let's see, how did I get interested in filmmaking? When I, when I was in college, I made a list of all the things I loved and thought I was good at. And I looked at the list and I thought, oh, I bet I'd like making documentary films. Um, <laughs> so it was sort of random, um, and I'm dating myself here, but there was no useful internet when I finished college. So there was no way to find a job, um, easily like that. And I didn't know any documentary filmmakers and you couldn't like look up D in the phone book. So I, uh, I ended up going to graduate school for journalism at Columbia in large part to try and have access to the alumni network so that I could find a job and, and start working in documentary film. Um, and that was really how I started. I went, came to New York for graduate school and then I applied for one job uh, when I finished school and I, I got the job and I ended up staying in New York. What a, a delightfully logical way to arrive <laughs> at, at your career path. You just write down at what you're good at and you say, hey, I think I might be good at this. And then you just you just do that. You apply for one job. I mean, that's that's wonderful. I it was love, great. Love I that. don't know. <laughs> I, um, well, I mean, I'm making it sound like it wasn't work. I mean, you right. know, there were many years in between there where I wanted to make films and I wasn't making, I mean, before I went to graduate school and I was running around telling everybody, hey, do you know any documentary filmmaker? I mean, I was trying. I wrote a bunch, I went, I went to Brown as an undergraduate and I um, went to the alumni office and I looked up in their files, all of their alumni who did filmmaking and I photocopied all of their names. And then I went home and I wrote letters and printed out letters and signed the letters and sent letters to all the Brown alumni who did film. And I, I ended up getting an internship that way. Um, that, that's a brilliant idea, a, a great approach. And, you know, yeah, so l let it never be said that, uh, you know, anyone achieves uh, really any level of success overnight. Uh, that just no. isn't how life works. So yeah, no, no doubt a, a really challenging, challenging path to get to where you are today. Um, so that's, that, that's awesome. And, and some great advice too, if, you know, whatever career field you're interested, even just looking up alumni of certain schools and just kind of taking that initiative and reaching out to them uh, in the way that you did. I think that's, that's great kind of career advice too. For, so there you go. That's, that's free. We won't even charge you all for that. <laughs> um, well, make, just make sure your letters don't have any grammar errors. 
That's well, good. yes, make sure it's good too. That's the other caveat. <laughs> um, uh, also, a quick shout out to uh, Heather and Brian uh, watching in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, some good friends of mine who uh, it's been a little while since I've heard from them and it's, it's great to see them in the comments. So hi guys, it's nice to, nice to see you virtually like this. Um, now, of course, we're, we're talking about your, your forthcoming film, which I, I don't know if I mentioned, it's gonna air this Sunday on MSNBC, October 24th at 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and if you can't stay up that late, I'm sure you can DVR it. That's what I'm planning to do. Um, so that, that's going to be good. And if you can't catch it, then it's going to air the following Sunday or, no, or Friday. Uh, Friday, sorry, the following 29th. Friday, uh, October 29th, also at 10 p.m. And if somehow you can't catch any of those times, it will eventually live on Peacock, the streaming service. So there's a multiplicity of ways to watch this. And hopefully by the end of our conversation, you'll be as eager as I am to uh, to watch the film. So how did you come to deciding you wanted to make a film on this subject? Uh, and I, I also should have noted that you're, I believe, the writer and the director of this project. So, yeah, well, I, uh, okay, I finished my last film. In, I was finishing with sort of the publicity of it and the release of it in 2014. And by 2015, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I had two small children. Um, who were relatively new to the world. And I needed to come up with a project that I could do that wouldn't, wouldn't take me overseas. And my previous films had both taken me very far afield and I knew that I couldn't really work in the same way anymore. So I needed a film project. My, my two previous films were both very story-based. They were following stories and events that occurred over time. And in order to do that, you really have to be in a particular place at a particular moment in order to make those films work. And you really can't do that when you have small children because you can't like say to the baby, sorry, gotta run, <laughs> gotta film that scene over there. That doesn't work. So I needed a project that would allow me essentially that if I couldn't film something, it wouldn't be the end of the world. I could always film something else, right? A, a much more flexible form. Uh, structurally. And I was looking around and uh, soon after the massacre at the Emanuel Amy Church in Charleston, South Carolina, I was listening to a podcast. It was actually about educational standards in the state of Texas. And it was talking about those standards and how there had been a woman on the board of education there who was quite vehement about the fact that slavery was not the cause of the war. And I just never knew, because I didn't grow up in the South, that there were people in the South who really believed that slavery was not the fundamental cause of the war. And it occurred to me that if we are as a nation telling different stories about our history, uh, it's gonna be really hard to have a united country. And I asked myself, well, what are we teaching our children? What are they learning? And so the original question, the original thought here was to go to different schools around the country and to look at how children are being taught today. And uh, at, at a very base level, it's, I think, a fascinating project just to get some some data points, you know, just to, to see what kind of variance there is. And, you know, school to school, all kinds of things are going to vary. Um, but when we're talking about, you know, the same exact historical event, um, that's, you know, a very kind of contained sort of thing. And so that's a, a at least in my mind, a fascinating project. And we'll talk about the process of that in just a moment, but I'm kind of intrigued by your title, uh, which again is Civil War or Who Do We Think We Are? And I kind of have a soft spot for titles with or uh, <laughs> as sort of the preface for the subtitle. So, so I, I enjoyed that, uh, but I was curious for um, you know how you all and I know the process of choosing a title sometimes is out of the hands of the creator. And so I'm curious for that whole process and, and why you settled on that. Um, well, this title, I always thought it was too long and kind of awkward. And I really didn't want to pick it as the title. I wanted something short and sweet and simple and not awkward. Um, my first film is called Our Brand is Crisis, which is really a terrible title for like cocktail parties because you say the title and nobody knows what you said and then they get confused and they, like 10,000 different versions of our brand in crisis, our brand of crisis, crisis is our brand, just doesn't work. So with my second film, I titled it Big Men, which is short and easy 
And I always wanted to find like a short and easy title for this one. And I couldn't, I just couldn't, I, I tried. Um, Civil War, uh, I mean, it's nice. I refer to the film and many people refer to the film as Civil War. That's, that's great to have that short version. But the, or who do we think we are is there because it was the working title. Um, this is the one time that I have not changed the title from the working title once the film was done. Um, and it's really just because I couldn't think of a better one. I, I, I think that parenthetical is really essential to understand what the film is doing and what it's fundamentally about. And that this isn't really a film just about history. It's a film about our history and our present and how our history lives with us today and how it shapes who we are as a nation, who gets to be part of that we, like when we say we, who are we representing all of those questions? So, and, and by the way, there's no question mark at the end of the title to get really nerdy about it. Um, because I didn't, it's, it's, it's as much a statement as it is an inquiry, right? It's a demand kind of to ask the question. So it was the best title I could come up with. Yeah, that's uh, that's very fair. It's it's a challenging project, I think, to kind of put a little bow on for I think a variety of reasons. Uh, and I think you know the title that you settled on kind of tackles that well because in in so many ways uh, the Civil War, you know, kind of well, and we talk about this at the Museum of Civil War Medicine. This is certainly true with the evolu evolution of medical care, uh, but you could expand this to a host of other things. The Civil War very much lays the foundation upon which our, our modern country is kind of uh, established upon. Uh, and there are, you know, pluses and minuses associated with that. Um, and so we'll, I think we'll, we'll get into some of those, but so I think that's very much true uh, of the Civil War era. And so when, you know, making the demand, as you put it, of who do we think we are? Um, I think a lot of it kind of goes back to how we and I also love that you said it's it's our history in the present. Um, so there, there's there's a lot of I think really excellent points wrapped up in that. So you've you we've latched on to a really interesting topic. It's a cool project. How do you actually go about putting this together um, between filming, you know, crafting a narrative? Because you know you can't just show ten thousand interviews with students and teachers. Um, you gotta. There has to be some, you know, some kind of narrative to it. So, how did you tackle that project? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, well, when you start uh, you, a project like this, a project that's based on questions rather than a set narrative, I mean, I think it. It you have to say, and just identify that um, most documentary work that's being done in the United States today, and I this is not true all over the world, it's just, it's true here, is, is work where you can write the proposal and say, this is what it is, this is what it's about, these are the main characters, here's the story. It's very story-based work that we're involved with today in this country. Um, I, having done two very story-based films, really felt the limitations of that and didn't, like, actively wanted to kind of push against the notion that this was about one story, it's quite deliberately not about one story. It's, it's not my story. It's not one character's story. It's the story of a country. And it's trying actually to reflect back on the viewer and get them to think about their own participation in the story. Okay, so there's, you start with that idea. But the reality is in the beginning, you don't know what you're doing. So you go and you start. <laughs> That's how any project starts. And you go out and you, you need to have enough money to start. And you, in my case, hire a cameraman and I do my own sound. And we went to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we started filming a semester long class on the Civil War and Reconstruction at an all boys private school there that I got access to. And I didn't know what we were doing. I mean, we overshot the heck out of that school. I could have made a whole movie about Macaulay about this, about this one school. So. Um, I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out. I was going and filming material and then watching material and responding to the material. And what ends up happening as you're making a project like this one that's based on questions rather than a set story is you watch your material and you respond to it. And you think, okay, what does this mean? Okay, what else do I need here? What am I, you try to think about your holes 
what's missing from what you have. So if you go and you film at a private school with a bunch of white kids, you think, okay, maybe I should go film at a public school, or maybe I should go film at a school with a bunch of black kids, or maybe I should film, what can I do that isn't what I've done? Um, if I've been to the South, I wanna to go to the North. So you're, my goal was to constantly respond to what I had and to try and fill in the gaps. And then over time, you discover the through lines, you see the strands that are connecting the material that you have. It's a very expensive way of shooting. It takes a lot of time. I mean, it's only expensive if you're paying yourself, which I didn't really do all the time. But it's, it, it does take an enormous amount of time and it, it's, it's, not, it's certainly not the easy path. So this is not the normal way of making a movie at all. Um, but in the cutting room, like one of the themes of the movie of this particular film has to do with the fact that no one wants to talk about it. I mean, you just see that over and over and over again, North and South, white and black. No one really wants to talk about this for a lot of different reasons. Um, and so that was one thing that we saw in the material. I mean, there are other strands too that go throughout. Yeah, that, that makes a, a ton of sense. I mean, uh, so often, to start something, you just have to start doing it. Um, and that, that's a really, really great point. And one of the reasons why I love kind of interviewing all these interesting people um, on, on our YouTube channel here is sometimes in the asking of the question, I realized I, you know, I didn't even have the right question in, in the first place. So it's not so much about you know, how you're crafting the narrative, you're just kind of taking it all in and then, you know, uh, in many ways, much as sort of a historian gathers evidence, you're like, exactly like you said, identifying the through lines, saying, okay, here are some patterns that are emerging in the evidence that, that I'm gathering. So that's, uh, that's brilliant. Uh, and you, you may have just answered my, my next question here, but I, I, one of the things I was very curious about is, you know, as you're going about trying to, you know, to get this footage. Um, did you find it that teachers, students, people in general uh, around the country were kind of eager to be a part of this or was there a reluctance or, I mean, I'm sure it was a mixture of course, but um, what was that um, like? Well, you know, my reference points were quite specific. I, I, my first film was about a group of American political consultants running a presidential campaign. And my second film was about an American oil company in West Africa and a bunch of militants in the Niger Delta. So I, my previous films were about people who really didn't want to talk to me, like really didn't want to talk to me for a, a variety of reasons. And I was quite used to sort of chipping away and knocking on the door 20 times in order to get let in. Um, so by comparison, this was easy because if somebody said no to me, I could just ask somebody else. Like it, it wasn't like I only had one person. It goes back to my, you know, I need more flexibility because I have children thing. Um, I, this was way easier than the things I've done in the past in terms of, because it's just more flexible as a story. Um, that said, did I find that people were willing to talk? You know, I, I don't, I don't remember asking, inviting a lot of people to film with and having them say no. I don't remember that. Um, but I think by the time I would ask somebody, hey, is it okay if I film? Like I would know them and they would know me. Sure. Um, and I wasn't asking to film highly sensitive information, I was asking to film often history classes or you know, people talking about things that they were very passionate about and cared deeply about. Um, there were some people who didn't return my phone calls, but there are always people who don't return your phone calls. So. Yeah, well, that, that's a great point because you know, sort of uh, as you're saying earlier, you know, the main character, if you wanna call it that is you know, the nation, you know, the, the United States. So, uh, you know, if, if one person turns you down, you have sort of a borderline infinite number of folks. I mean, if you went to school in the United States at some point and took, a, you know, we're in a class on the Civil War, you know, you're quote unquote eligible <laughs> to, to have something to say. Um, I just this, remembered uh, one situation I wasn't allowed to film. I just thought of one. There's, okay. Let me think of one. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking about it. Um, there was a school in Mississippi that was changing its name 
from the um, Jefferson Davis, the Davis School. It's called the Davis mm -hmm. School it's for Jefferson Davis. And they were having, it was a predominantly black public school and they were having the kids vote on what they wanted the name to be. And I wanted to film the vote and they wouldn't let me film the vote. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I wanted to film that I couldn't. Sure, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, fascinating in its own right. Um, so, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about your process and how you went about it and how you came to the idea, um, you know, and of course, you know, you want people to watch the film, but, um, you know, what, um, what sort of stuff did you find uh, when you went out there and, and, you know, you started talking with people and, and sitting in on classes and things like that? Um, what, what, what came out as you uh, were, were looking into this? Um, well, I, as I mentioned, I found a lot of hesitation about talking about painful things in our past. Um, I found a lot of passion about this narrative uh, in places that I hadn't anticipated it, especially in the South. There are a lot of very deeply rooted, passionate feelings about history and about family and about family stories and about honoring your ancestors um, and not telling stories that dishonor your ancestors. Um, I found, I found, you know, one of the big challenges of this film was figuring out how to film silences because there are so many pieces of the story that haven't been talked about, right? That have just been, you know, they've not erased, but people have tried to efface them. And so figuring out how you make those things visual, how you tell a story that brings them to life, that was really a challenge with the film, specifically with reconstruction, because it's a period of time that has been so poorly told during our history. Yeah, that's a, a, another great point. I mean, there, there are so many different angles to this. Um, many of which, as you just noted, you know, have not been, um, you know, well told uh, both in and outside of classrooms. Um, so yeah, trying to identify the, the, the uh, items to, to bring to the forefront. It's interesting to me, um, you know, just to kind of hear you describing some of this that um, there's, which is I think a hallmark of this very subject uh, about you know how we learn about the Civil War that there's kind of a reluctance to talk about it, but there's also really deep passion there as well. And you know it, it's it's odd I think to find you know uh, some of the same people are reluctant to talk about something they're passionate about, um, which is a little curious to me. Well, they're not reluctant to talk about certain things. They're just sure. reluctant to talk about others. I mean, this is a story, the story of the war was ultimately, um, what, the story of the war was written by the people who lost in the end. Um, and this, the lost cause narrative, as David Blight says in the film, became this victory narrative during Reconstruction, where it was the story that vanquished Reconstruction. Um, I often think about, I thought about this a lot when we were making the film. Last year was the first time that the emancipation of 4 million people was officially recognized as a national holiday, right? With Juneteenth. That's remarkable. I mean, let's just pause for a second and think about that. That there was a time in our country's history when 4 million enslaved people were set free like, or some people would say freed themselves, right? But they achieved liberation, four million of them. And we have not recognized that as a national holiday. So it's not necessarily that people won't talk. It's that very important parts of this narrative have been quite deliberately silenced over time. And people aren't necessarily even aware of them. They weren't taught them in school. And that makes it hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, very true. You, know, you, you don't know what you don't know, as the saying goes. And part of the, the beauty of something like the internet is, you know, with the greater democratization of information, there's more access out there. Of course, 
the double-edged sword of that is there's more misinformation out there, you know, than, than ever before. And so maybe we're just sort of back to square one, even though I just said that, you know, the internet is, is wonderful in this regard, but it's just as bad in, in other regards. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a definite challenge for sure. Um, as you were going through this uh, and you're identifying these through lines, um, was there anything that particularly surprised you? I mean, because you're, as we kind of talked about earlier, you're just kind of beginning, you're, you're setting off. And uh, I think some of the great pivot points in any research project, and I think this certainly qualifies as that, um, are when you get surprised by something. So what were some of those surprises for you along the way? Um, well, I'm white. And so I think sort of a white point of view comes most naturally to me because that's who I am walking through America. Um, and I, two things come to mind. Um, I was surprised to recognize the huge gaping holes in my own, you know, very glorious education at these institutions that everyone says are so wonderful. Like there was a lot missing from what I had been taught in terms of what was considered important enough to teach, who I had been told I had to read, who was left out of those reading lists. Um, and recognizing that over the course of making this film, trying to rectify that for myself, like beefing up my own library and essentially giving myself a course in what is called African-American history, but really should be American history. Like that was shocking to me to recognize how ignorant I was about so many things that I really needed to know. Um, the other thing that was surprising to me, there's a scene in the film or there's a section of the film that deals with a place called Holmes County, Mississippi. I filmed at a public school there. And that's a place that's interesting for several, several reasons. One, um, it was deeply marked by enslavement, right? Like, I think it's fair to say, I mean, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's fair to say, it should be fact, that basically all the black people who live there are descended from enslaved people. Like there's been very little influx of black people in Holmes County, it's very small. Um, maybe there's been a little, but most of the people who are there are people who have, whose families have been there for a long time. So uh, that was a place where many black people were enslaved. After the war, during, uh, okay. After Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, American public schools did not desegregate uh, because in that decision, there was a line that said, with all deliberate speed, thou shalt desegregate with all deliberate speed, right? And especially schools in the South, but also schools in places like Boston, like in the North, they decided to sort of privilege deliberate over speed and they just didn't do it. So it wasn't until 1969 that this, um, Supreme Court decision called Brown, uh, sorry, it's called Holmes, Alexander versus Holmes County Board of Education. That decision was the decision that really desegregated America, where the Supreme Court said, okay, it's over, no more waiting, you need to do this now. Okay, that was because of Holmes County, Mississippi. When I went to Holmes County, Mississippi today, there was one public school left and it was all black. That's because all the white kids, went to the private school. Not a single one of them went to the public school. That surprised me. I mean, it shouldn't have surprised me because it's like that all over, not just Mississippi, but many places in the South where these things called segregation academies popped up. I just didn't live in the South, so I didn't realize that. Number two, the black kids at Holmes County High School didn't talk about enslavement. Their families didn't talk about it. Nobody talked about it. There was no narrative that was being passed down from generation to generation. They didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to think about it. It was too painful. And that recognizing that there were these different reasons for not wanting to talk about this past, that you know maybe white people didn't want to talk about it because it was shameful and painful in that way, but black people didn't want to talk about it because it was painful in a totally different way. So. That was for me a revelation. I just didn't, I hadn't really thought about that before. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Um, and it, hearing you talk, it, it strikes me that, um, you know, 
kind of a potentially um, surprising, uh, really important moment in the story of kind of the education of America about the Civil War era probably is the desegregation of schools, Brown versus the Board of Education. Did you find that just as you were kind of going through the history? I mean, I know you're kind of talking a lot about our history in the present, but was that a, a comparably significant sort of data point to even the Civil War era itself as you were going through this project? Well, because I was filming in classrooms, it was very important to document modern segregation because it's a huge part of our education system all over the place. This is not mm -hmm. a Southern problem. This is an American problem. It's, mm -hmm. I live in New York City. It is a huge problem in New York City. Like this is a problem everywhere I looked. So, um, and it's for a variety of reasons and it has a variety of ripple effects, um, but we have not solved this issue of segregation in our educational system. Uh, there is racial segregation. There is a seg segregation by economic privilege. I mean, in New York City, a private school costs $54,000 a year. Now, who has $54,000 a year to send their children to private school from K through 12? I mean, so there's a, there are parallel systems that exist. And I'm not saying, by the way, that they shouldn't exist. There are advantages. Like you should have choice for your kids. But the reality is that um, the way our neighborhoods are organized, the way our PTAs are funded, um, it, it, it further exacerbates the um, redlining segregation that exists because of a different history. That was another history that I read about that I hadn't known anything about before I made this film because no one ever taught it to me, was the in insane history of redlining in this country. Um, I always wondered why our neighborhoods were so segregated. They were quite deliberately segregated. Um, and then the history of sundown towns. I mean, and there's a kind of a frightening book by James Lowen called Sundown Towns that is sort of amazing about modern sundown towns. But anyway, yes, it's an important part of the story. And it was important to document it in terms of visually filming in these segregated spaces. Mm -hmm. and, and and to your point, um, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I've not seen the film, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, you know, you don't kind of wrap this all up with a neat little bow at the, you know, at the end of the film. No, um, it's not. It's not. The film itself, like I said before, it's deliberately non-narrative. It's not it's not trying to give you a satisfying ending. It is bookended, sure. as we say in filmmaking. It starts with a scene and it ends with the same scene or the same location, um, which editorially helps you give us a sense of, you know, starting and ending. You, you, the, the goal is always to feel differently about the thing in the end than you did in the beginning. Um, but it doesn't wrap itself up in a neat bow because it's intended as a catalyst for conversation. This is what I really want with this film is I want it to be shown in schools. I want it to be shown in houses of worship. I want people to invite people who aren't like them to come and sit and watch it with them. And then I want people to talk about it with each other. I want there to be conversation groups. I want, you know, local clubs to have screenings. I, I want people to watch this movie and talk to each other about it. That's, that's the point. Uh, excellent. And you, uh, I remember even as we were, you know, uh, coordinating to kind of set this up, you know, uh, we were debating between doing a, you know, live program or pre-recorded. And, you know, you mentioned how important the idea of having conversations is uh, to you, which is, I think, a really, really noble, noble goal. And I certainly hope uh, that's what comes out of this. Um, you know, it, this is, you know, a little bit of armchair psychology on my part, but I think there's something to it. Um, you know, at least my memory is that there was, you know, just the sense that the two things you never really talked about in polite conversation were religion or politics. And, you know, it's no wonder we're so bad at talking about religion and politics and, you know, sort of public settings. It's, it's like a muscle that we just don't really use. And so it's atrophied so much, um, you know, it, it, you're not very good at it. Um, so 
again, there's a little armchair psychology there, but I think there really is something to that. And so that's why I think your earnest desire for conversation, even if it's inartful, um, just for it to happen, I think is a victory. I, I also think there's a problem with our tone in this country right now. Um, sure. I think it's been exacerbated by the former president. I think it's exacerbated by social media. Um, I think the it, it create we have a situation in this country right now, it's gotten much worse since I started making the film, where people are constantly trying, uh, of all political stripes, are constantly trying to prove their point and they're not listening to the other side. And oftentimes these conversations have to do with facts, right? Or alternative facts. When really what people are talking about is feelings. And it's impossible to have a conversation with somebody debating facts when what they're really talking about is how they feel about something, right? And so I think there needs to be a shift here where the first thing we do when we have a conversation with someone we don't like or we don't agree with, first of all, we all have to agree to listen to each other. I mean, that needs to be step number one. And often that's not the case. People aren't interested in listening. And if they're not interested in listening, then there's kind of no conversation to be had. So we all have to come to the table saying, we're gonna listen to each other. And, and there's a chapter in the film that deals with empathy. Um, it's the last chapter of the film. Um, but I've thought a lot about how the film ends with empathy, but in a certain way, it's kind of the starting point, right? It's where we need to begin in order to achieve a real reunion in this country that represents all of its citizens. Yeah, that's such an important point uh, about listening because if there's no listening, it's not a conversation. Um, it just doesn't happen at all. And I, I think your, uh, your point about tone is comparably uh, as, as important um, because you know, if you come into a conversation you know, with the intensity of eight, it's a lot harder to ratchet that down. Uh, and I think especially with the pandemic, uh, people have been having a lot more digital and text conversations. And my wife, uh, one of the things that she's very passionate about is that emojis are very important because it's a way that you can get across tone uh, in, in, you know, in, a, in a text format. It's like, you know, if you say something that you intend as a joke, and you put a little winky face emoji after it, you don't take that seriously when you read it. Um, and, you know, like there's been plenty of times when, you know, her, me and her have uh, exchanged text messages and, you know, uh, one of us doesn't put an emoji and like we misread the, the statement entirely. So with so many people, you know, conversing via the internet and, and things because everyone, you know, more often than not over the last year and a half, people are, you know, in home and not not having face-to-face -face conversations, there's kind of a tone, you know, people get their sort of their wires crossed. So um, there we go. I, I stumped from my wife on the uh, the importance of emojis. So th there you are. If, for all, any of you watching who don't think emojis are important, uh, think about it. <laughs> uh, well, this has just been, uh, I think, absolutely wonderful, Rachel. I think this has been a, a great conversation, or at least uh, uh, I know I've enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. I hope you have too. And, and I hope everyone else out there has enjoyed it as well. Um, please uh, take some time to go out of your way and uh, watch the film. I know I'm going to do so. Uh, premieres, you can watch it live with the nation um, on October 24th, this upcoming Sunday, 10 p.m. on MSNBC. And then it'll re-air. 10 p.m. Eastern. 10 p.m. Eastern, thank you. Uh, because we have people watching all over the place. We, uh, we actually had someone tuning in from Venezuela today, um, which is really exciting. So. Let's see here. Um, popping back over to the comments. I um, want to make sure I didn't miss any questions here. Um, okay, we, we got a couple coming in here towards, uh, towards the end. Um, Kaylee asks, uh, through doing these interviews and filming, were you able to change any minds or open any perspectives of those involved? Uh, was there any metamorphosis? Um, which, I mean, I, I'm not sure that you're intention was to go and change people's minds, but um, I guess the, did you notice any perspectives changing um, uh, while you were involved? Yeah, not while I was filming. I mean, that wasn't, as you say, that wasn't really my goal to try and change people's minds. I'm hopeful that the film itself 
might change people's minds. That there's, you know, I think changing people's minds about things, especially things like this that are so deeply entrenched in terms of feelings and belief, it doesn't happen overnight. This is not, you don't just like have a conversation and I mean, maybe every once in a blue moon that happens, but it's very rare for someone to have a conversation and be utterly transformed by it. It takes time and it takes facts and it takes persistence. I, I spoke with a lot of professors who talk about, you know, having students come to their class who've been taught a certain history by their families that is not accurate and having to combat that as a professor, having to try and figure out how do you talk to a student who has these very deeply rooted beliefs that have been passed down, maybe related to the lost cause or whatever. Um, and the professors have almost universally said that they teach, they teach laws, that they'll, they'll try and essentially teach documentation. They'll show these students the facts, right? And if you keep doing that over time, again and again, keep doing it gradually, gradually over time, as long as the conversation continues, there then there can be transformation. Um, but it really does, it takes effort and it takes time. Yeah, and you know, real relationships. Yeah. Um, you know, consistent, you know, consistently being there for a person and, you know, not necessarily saying that, you know, these professors, teachers and students are, you know, going out for coffee all the time, but, but they're in relationship and that they're interacting on a regular basis, they're known quantities and, and, you know, they show up for each other on a consistent basis. So I think the relational element over time is, is key. Um, a question from the civil war dude. Um, who I'm guessing maybe joined us midway through, uh, they ask, uh, is there a new movie coming out? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, yes, uh, there is a new docu documentary film coming out, Civil War, or Who Do We Think We Are? Um, all about, uh, for those of you that maybe joined us midway through, how the Civil War is taught in classrooms uh, around the country. Um, and that's airing again this Sunday at 10 p.m. Eastern time, uh, October 24th on MSNBC. And if you don't catch that uh, or uh, any of the other re-airs, there's going to be another one on October 29th, um, also at 10 p.m. Eastern on MSNBC. Uh, it will continue to exist in the digital world uh, on the Peacock streaming app. So it's it'll be out there for, for you to find. Um, one last question. I think it's uh, kind of, uh, you can take this in whatever direction uh, you would like to, Rachel. Uh, Robert asks, where or who did you find had the most courage in dealing with imperfections found in our civil war and reconstruction? Oh, that's easy. Um, I mean, look, there are a lot of people who have a lot of courage when it comes to this history. Um, but in terms of my filming and what's actually in the movie, um, there's one woman I filmed with and a white woman in Mississippi. She's a professor um, at Mississippi College in Clinton. Her name is Melissa Jones, and she has been very actively involved for over 15 years now, um, closer to 20 probably by now, uh, trying to get up this marker in Clinton, Mississippi that acknowledges uh, an event that on the marker is called the Clinton riots, but really should be called the Clinton massacre. It happened in 1875, it's when a bunch of white Democrats came to a political rally of a bunch of black Republicans and they brought guns and it, they turned it violent. And um, over the course of the next several days, they sought out the people who had been at that rally, the black Republicans, and the white liners went and they killed them often in front of their families. So it was this massacre that unfolded over several days. Huge event in the city that has never been publicly acknowledged. Not only has it, well, it, it was publicly taught in schools, but it was mistaught. It was actually told, the narrative that was taught in schools was that it was the black people who were shooting at the white people. So not only was it not accurately acknowledged, but it was mistaught for many, many, many years. And yes. Missy, she's called Missy, um, has taken it upon herself to try, not single-handedly, because there are other people who are involved, but to try and get this marker put up in her town. And um, on camera in my film, the reason why I think of her in terms of bravery is it, someone else in a scene 
in the film brings up um, the fact that she was raised in a racist family. And she's sort of forced to acknowledge that on camera and to talk about that publicly. It's very uncomfortable, right? Um, but it's a very brave thing, I think, that she does in the film to acknowledge it and to talk about it and to talk about um, what that meant to her and how it motivated her to try and do something different. That's a, an incredible story. And, uh, and, and exactly why I think a project like this is so valuable, just demonstrating the ways where, you know, it, in, in, on a very grand scale, like, you know, actual events are completely misrepresented um, like that. Just, I mean, changing the, the, the facts entirely. So that, that's uh, an incredible story. Um, so as we're kind of coming down to the, uh, the end of our time here, uh, you know, if you're watching this and you're, you're tuning in, odds are you're interested to some degree in the, uh, the American Civil War. So uh, I challenge uh, all of us watching here to, uh, you know, wa watch the film and, and try and find at least one person or more to, to talk about it with. So um, not uh, like you. talk to someone you like, talk to someone who's politically different from you or di just different from you in some way. Sure. About the movie. Absolutely. Um, so there we go. We've uh, we've mentioned the, uh, the the multitude of ways to to track down the film. Uh, and if you uh, have any questions uh, about that, you can reach out to us here at the museum, or you can uh, you know find uh, Rachel and and her uh, production company on on the various social medias across the internet. Um, if you have any questions about how to how to find that, or you can just Google it, um, which uh, it always always helps. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, uh, I enjoyed this conversation. Uh, if you all enjoyed uh, the video, go ahead and hit the like button. And if you want to stay up to date on all the latest programming that we're doing, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Those are easy, free, simple ways uh, you can help support what we do. Um, if you want to take your support one step further, uh, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine uh, for as little as $25 a year, uh, which is just a couple bucks a month. You can support programming like this. So uh, with all that said, thank you so much, Rachel, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Excellent. Uh, so uh, next week, uh, I think we're back next Friday um, with our next edition of our On Tour series, uh, where we're gonna be tracing the paths of uh, three wounded soldiers uh, in the Maryland campaign. Um, so tune in for that and uh, it should be a good one. So until then everyone, 